any other questions before we get going? That's a complicated answer. I know, zebras, it's full of, full of interesting stories. Okay, folks, guess what we are gonna do today? We are gonna do cosmology. Not cosmetology. We're gonna do cosmology one which is FRW, and you'll understand what FRW means in just a little bit, okay? So today, we're going to kind of apply general relativity to the entire universe, and we're gonna set up the math that's associated with it, and we're gonna kind of get to a point where there's many different possibilities, and then next time, we're gonna come back and we're going to specifically address our universe, okay? But for today, we're just basically gonna be looking at cosmology in general, and then next time, we'll specify our universe. There's lots of jargon in this. Cosmology is its own field. People just dive down holes, develop language, this, that, and the other. I'm gonna introduce you to as much of that as I can, but hopefully, you can kind of think above it and not get lost in the details, because obviously, there's some really awesome conclusions to be drawn. And next time, we'll talk about, you know, some experimental results and how they play into the story. Okay? Now, you've probably figured that all the solutions that we've gotten so far, Minkowski space, the Schwarzschild solution, the Kerr solution, and that Reisner Nordstrom solution, which you might or might not have realized, um, all of those are based on assuming some kind of symmetry, some kind of asymptotic Minkowski space, everything's super clean, okay? And that's what makes solving Einstein's equations relatively straightforward. Okay, if you want to include like a, uh, 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 I don't want to say what I thought I was going to say. That's bad. A bird, it rhymes with bird, but it's not bird, in orbit around the Earth, and you want to kind of describe the, the gravitational uh, curvature associated with that, that'd be really hard. Okay, we usually take spherical objects or rotating spherical objects or simple things into, into our consideration. That simplifies Einstein's equations through the symmetries present in the theory. You can imagine if we want to apply this to the entire universe, it's going to be hard. Because we got planets, we got stars, we got birds, we got all kinds of stuff in the universe. So how in the world are we going to simplify it so that we can apply general relativity to the entire universe? Well, it's really simple. We're going to act like it's a soup. That is, we're going to take a scale so large that galaxies are atom-sized. We're basically going to take the entire universe to be a continuum, okay? And for a short-range calculation, that is a horrible approximation. But if you're dealing with the entire universe, that's a perfectly good approximation, okay? So the first and foremost simplest step of cosmology is just to assume that the universe is a uniform soup made of possibly different things, which we'll talk about in due time, okay? And what we're going to apply to this idea of a soup is a couple of important things. First and foremost, we're going to apply Einstein's equation, okay? However, here are a few important caveats for applying this to the entirety of the universe. First of all, t mu nu clearly does not equal zero. We are not doing the exterior solution of a spherically symmetric mass distribution and having that simple r mu nu equals zero form. The universe is full of stuff. Stuff creates contributions to the energy momentum tensor, so this is definitely not going to be zero. We've actually got several different possible contributions to this, and we'll go over those in due time. Next, and this is important, there is going to be no assumption of time independence. In fact, it's one of the most obvious observations that the universe is expanding, therefore things depend on time, so we can't start off with a time independent solution like we did with the Kerr geometry. We did not have to start off with that for the Schwarzschild, but for the Kerr we did. And then, last but not least, what we want to do is we want to identify symmetries which are present. Okay, because as usual, if you want to simplify solving Einstein's equations, 
identifying the symmetries, choosing coordinates associated with those symmetries, that is a huge help. So identifying the symmetries that are present in this really simple model uh, are gonna be important. So let's start off with a discussion of symmetries. In our universe, if we smooth over local structure, if we just assume the universe is a fluid of stuff, then there are two characteristics to the symmetries. There is first and foremost spatial homogeneity. Okay? And you might recall that spatial homogeneity corresponds to translational invariance. And then we have spatial isotropy. which corresponds, in a sense, to rotational invariance. Now let me very quickly give you examples of spaces which have one of these properties but not the other. So for example, a cylinder, if you have an infinite cylinder that's infinitely long, it's homogeneous but not isotropic. Okay. If you take the Schwarzschild solution, it is isotropic, at least about the center of the solution. You can look in any direction, everything looks the same, but it's definitely not homogeneous. Okay, if you move away from the center of the Schwarzschild solution, things look different. Okay? However, if you're on an infinitely long cylinder, you can move anywhere you want, it's gonna look the same. But if you look in different directions, it'll look different. If you look along the cylinder's axis, you'll see one thing. If you look perpendicular to the cylinder's axis, everything's closed, okay? Now, this sounds a hell of a lot like, okay, fine, Josh. This sounds a hell of a lot like, meh, meh. Minkowski space. Yes, yes. Remember? Translational rotational invariance was properties of Minkowski space, except Minkowski space is a space time. These are observations of spatial symmetries, okay? Not space time. The fact that these are symmetries of space and not space-time is somewhat obvious. The universe is expanding. The universe at this time is different than the universe at this time. There's definitely no translational invariance in time. Okay? That's also going to impact the isotropy involving time and the other coordinates. Now, together, these imply At any point, isotropy. Okay? Now think about that for a moment. Uh, we, 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 we talked about isotropy. And we talked about homogeneity. But if these are taken together, then at any point you have isotropy. Well, think about it. Translational invariance says this point is the same as this point, it's the same as this point, the same as this point. Isotropy says around this point everything looks the same, but if it's translational invariant, then that means at this point everything looks the same, at this point everything looks the same. Okay? Well, this implies something. This is a maximally symmetric spatial geometry. You might have to reach back into that lecture where we talked about symmetries, killing vectors, and so forth and so on. And you might or might not recall, but there is the simple case of a maximally symmetric space, and there's a specific result tied to that that we're going to make use of later. Okay. Well, here's another conclusion 
to this simple observation that these two spatial symmetries give us that at any point we have isotropy, and that is there's no center of our universe. There's no edge of our universe. If our universe were finite and you went to the edge and you look, you could look towards the edge if you're close to it and it would appear near you. And if you look this way, you'd see more. That's not the geometry of the universe. The geometry of the universe is no matter where you are, when you look around, you'll see the same thing. It's kind of weird, right? Can you give me an example of a non-trivial geometry that's like that? Where no matter where you are, when you look around, you see the same thing. And don't say flat space, that's boring. Sphere? A sphere, the surface of a sphere. If you're on the surface of the sphere and you look around, it doesn't matter where you are, you'll see the same thing. A sphere will play an important role as one of the possible spatial geometries, okay? All right, any questions about symmetries? Again, there's no time symmetry because the universe is evolving with time. Okay. However, we're going to use heavily these spatial symmetries. Now, for coordinates, in order to simplify the story, we are going to make use of what are called co-moving coordinates. And what this means is essentially that is our source. That's the entire universe. Here's a set of coordinates for it. Okay? Or here's some tick marks. You could imagine, and this is just imagine a spatial piece of the universe. We're talking about an instant in time taking a picture of the universe. Now, if the universe expands with time, there's a couple of situations you can imagine. One is that this blob grows and you keep this coordinate system fixed. Okay? That's what we typically do. However, for cosmology, it is much simpler to use a co-moving coordinate system. That is, if the universe expands, this coordinate system will expand with it. And that is going to keep the coordinate distance between things the same, even though those things are separating. Okay? That is, as long as they are separating from each other via the expansion of the universe, if they're actually moving away from each other, okay, then their distance can increase. You can obviously move around, but if you and I are sitting dead still with respect to each other, and the universe is expanding, pushing us apart, then our coordinate distance and coordinate coordinates is going to remain constant. Okay? All right. Okay. Are you ready? It's going to get ugly. All right. Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. We've got this symmetry, or we've got these symmetries. And what we're going to start with is a fiduciary form of the metric utilizing these symmetries. And here we go. ds squared equals minus dt squared plus r squared of t times gamma ij which could depend on you, D-U-I, D-U-J, okay? Where in this story, I and J take values from one, two, and three, okay? Now, first and foremost, this guy is dimensionless. Of course, this is a distance. This is a distance, and distance squared, distance squared, so this is dimension full. Okay? This guy right here is the T independent co moving spatial geometry.
Now let's just think about that for a moment. Notice, in this expression, there's no T dependence. You ignore all this, there's no T dependence. So that's the spatial geometry of the universe. To let it evolve with time, we just have this factor. Okay? Which is basically, it's, it's sort of a scale factor, although we'll introduce a technical scale factor difference to find in just a minute. Okay? Now, what's nice about this metric is it will preserve any spatial symmetry that we impose on it because the spatial, all of the spatial terms are collected here in isolation. So if we've got any spatial symmetry, this metric is guaranteed to preserve it. All right. Now, since our spatial geometry is maximally symmetric, you might or might not recall, but this means that there is a very simple expression for the Riemann tensor with total, with all of its components lowered. And in this case, it's going to be r over 6. Okay, the factor here depends on the dimensions. We're talking about three spatial dimensions. This is the Riemann tensor for the spatial geometry, not the space-time geometry. Okay, so you could ask what is r mu nu lambda beta. That would entail both the time and the spatial directions. But this is just for the three spatial components because they form a maximally symmetric space. This does not. I mean, remember, a maximally symmetric space has to share all of the local symmetries of flat space, but it's got to share it globally. The full space time does not share all of the symmetries of Minkowski space. It's time dependent. You can't just do a boost do a time translation, okay? So this is definitely not maximally symmetric, but this is. Now that being said, this can be given by gamma ik, gamma jl, minus gamma il, gamma jk, okay? Where we will just often refer to this as k, okay? And what's really interesting is that it turns out that the sine of k is going to tell us what kind of geometry the spatial geometry is satisfying. Because if you think about it, if you can remember at all when we talked about maximally symmetric spaces, I went through a list of what are the possible maximally symmetric spaces, okay? And it is basically the sine of the Ricci scalar, or the sine of k, either one, okay? So let's see if you can remember. If k equals zero, what kind of space do you think we're dealing with? Flat space. Flat space, exactly. And I can call this thing right here, this spatial metric times the spatial coordinate differentials, I can call this d sigma squared, which is different from ds squared. ds squared is the full space-time interval. But d sigma squared is just this spatial piece. And in this case, since the geometry is flat, this is going to take the form d chi squared plus chi squared d omega 2 squared, where chi is essentially a radial coordinate, but I don't want to call it r, okay, for reasons you'll see in a few minutes, okay, where the geometry, of course, is just r3, or flat space. Okay, so what about the case when k is positive? Anybody remember? Yes? Is that a sphere? It's a sphere, exactly. So we can write the spatial metric, in this case, as d chi squared plus sine squared chi d omega 2 squared. And in this case, we're dealing with an S3. In cosmology terms, this is also called a closed universe. Which should make sense, because if something is spherical, then it's got a finite volume. 
and stored closed. Okay? Last but not least, we have k less than zero. Okay? And by the way, there are no critical values of k. This is just a sign of k that matters. It's not like k bigger than one, k less than one. That's not important. It's just a sign that matters. If k is less than zero, then d sigma squared takes the following form. d chi squared plus sitch squared. d omega squared. And this is what we often call a hyperbolic space. And in this case, the space is open. It's infinite. It's infinite in the flat space case, too. Okay? Now, here's something ugly. Depending on the sign of k, what you put in here will look quite different. We don't want to mess with that. We want it to look the same. So let's do a bit of rewriting. So what we can do is we can define d chi as dr bar over the square root of 1 minus k r bar squared. OK? Note r bar and k are dimensionless. Okay? And in this case, we have that d sigma squared works out to be d r bar squared over the 1 minus k r bar squared plus r bar squared d omega 2 squared. Okay? Where k, in this case, will simply take the values 0, plus, or minus 1. To see how this works, let's take k equals minus 1. If k is equal to minus 1, then d chi is dr bar over the square root of 1 plus r bar squared. And we can take this and use it to find chi as a function of r bar. And we're just going to find chi as the inverse cinch of r bar. Okay. Well, there you go. I mean, r bar is the cinch of chi. R bar squared is cinch squared chi. Okay. So now we can just use k equals plus one, minus one, or zero, and it will return any of these three. But the good news is, is we can write the metric like this and just put in different values of k and it will achieve all of these different forms. Does everybody follow that, or do I need to do another example? What did you define r bar as? Say it again. What did you define r bar as? It's defined here. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, I, I can't write r bar equals something because the result depends on k. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I mean, in some cases it will be, you know, just one, and in some cases sine, and in some cases cinch. Okay, now, in terms of our bar, we have the following. D uh, squared is minus dt squared plus r squared t dr bar squared over 1 minus k r bar squared plus r bar squared d omega 2 squared. And this is what is often called the Robertson-Walker metric. OK? This is the metric which encodes spatial isotropy plus homogeneity plus T dependence. Okay? And again, all we've done is we've employed the fact that the spatial geometry is maximally symmetric, okay? 
and we use that to rewrite these three possibilities in a single common form. Okay? And now we're going to introduce some nomenclature. Again, this is just following down the cosmologist's uh, horrible track. So first and foremost, let's introduce a dimensionless scale factor, which is the scale factor R of t divided by the current scale factor R naught, whatever that happens to be. So this is a dimensionless scale factor. We can define R as R naught times R bar, which is now a dimension full distance. Remember, R bar was dimensionless, but since we're multiplying it by this current scale factor, we're now giving R bar a dimension. And then we're going to introduce something we call capital K as little k over R naught squared. And this is going to represent a dimension full spatial curvature. Okay, I'm not going to write all those words up there. But we've got the dimension less scale factor, the dimension full distance, and the dimension full scale spatial curvature. In terms of these, I can rewrite the metric as follows, minus dt squared plus a squared t times br squared over 1 minus k r squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay? And now I want you to tell me, Ben, how many unknowns are in that metric? We should just do some counting somehow. And we're, we're obviously working with the coordinates, and I guess I should write it up here. T, R, theta, and P. Well, actually, we, we can work with any coordinates we want, but we can use the Parabola coordinates just to, for simplicity. We're doing that when we write D omega squared. But how many unknowns are in that? R bar is a coordinate, so don't treat it as an unknown. I mean, look at this form of it. How many unknowns? Uh, just two, right? Or yeah. Two. No, what are they? Um, K, capital K, and just A of T. Right. I mean, that's a pretty damn simple picture, right? But again, a maximally symmetric space, that's one of the most symmetric spaces you could ask for. Okay? Now this isn't entirely maximally symmetric, it's only maximally symmetric spatially. Okay, but we can still get a lot out of that. We can reduce the metric, which is in principle 16 or 10 unknowns, down to two unknowns, two unknown functions. Okay? All right, to get Further, what we're going to have to do is we're actually going to have to explore Einstein's equation. So let's go there. Let's not be afraid. I'm sure I'll regret this at some point. Einstein's equations, g mu nu, equals 8 pi g t mu nu. So we're going to need some expression for t mu nu. We're going to have to have some description of the source, what's in the universe. Okay, first and foremost, if we assume a perfect fluid, which is a pretty reasonable assumption, then recall the expression that we found for a perfect fluid in terms of the overall four vector velocities, okay, of the fluid. And what we will, of course,
course do is assume we are at rest with respect to that overall fluid, okay? If you're at rest with respect to the overall fluid, then the four velocity of the fluid source is just one zero zero zero, okay? As a matrix, okay, we can take this, we can lower it with that metric and combine it with the ML metric and we're gonna find the following row, zero, 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 zero times G, I, J, P. Okay. Where G, I, J is not the gamma ij that I had pleasantly written in this erased metric, okay? This thing will incorporate that RT factor. Because if you think about it, this is the true four-dimensional picture of the energy momentum. There's the time piece, this is the spatial pieces. The spatial part of space-time involves that R factor. We were looking also at just the spatial geometry in co-bending coordinates so that R factor becomes irrelevant when we were talking about deriving that, okay? So this can be different from this because the, the, three, the, the, the spatial part of the space-time metric depends on time through that R factor. Now, in order to use Einstein's equation, we can use its trace-reversed form. And of course, this gives us r mu nu is eight pi g t mu nu minus one half g mu nu times the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And so what we can do is we can take this metric, shove it into there. We can ask Mathematica, here's a metric, find the Ricci tensor. And then we can take this energy momentum tensor, which still has the unknown metric in it, and we can shove it into this side, okay? And then this, of course, is going to be a network of how many equations? PJ. 10. 10? Oh man, <laughs> you got the right answer with miscounting. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so you said one for this and nine for this because this is three by three? Yes. Okay, does anybody want to help them out? Hey, you got the right answer, the right answer. So this is awesome. Yesterday, I was having a discussion with somebody. Oh, we were talking about Lon Kappa, how sometimes uh, people have coded problems into Lon Kappa where you know it's supposed to randomize some of the answers and they code in the, the distractor answers. And sometimes there are problems where you can code in a distractor wrong answer through, through, through a formula, but it actually gives you the same numerical result as the correct answer. So when they're working out this long capital problem, it's like A is two, B is two. Uh, which is it, A or B? I don't know. <laughs> okay, does anybody wanna help them out on why it's 10? Yeah, this is a symmetric matrix. It's a four by four matrix. Don't look at the, don't look at this. You gotta look at this. This is a four by four matrix that's diagonally symmetric. So you get the diagonals plus a half. That gives you 10. <laughs> Sorry, that was good. That was awesome. So anyway, okay, I'm gonna keep going. I gotta hurry up. Oh man, we have so much fun. Okay, so I'm gonna look at two parts of this. I'm gonna look at what I get from taking R mu equals zero, nu equals zero, and then just a mix of spatial indices, so Rij as an example. And it turns out for this one I get minus three A double dot, where an A double dot is the second derivative of A with respect to time, okay? Three A, minus three A double dot over A equals four pi G rho plus three P, 
And then for the ij, we get a double dot over a plus 2 a dot over a squared plus 2 capital K over a squared, which is 4 pi g rho minus p. Okay? And looking at it, can anybody see a glorious thing I can do with, this ex with these two expressions? Exactly, but the way we prefer to do it is just to multiply this by 3 and then add these two because that gets rid of the second derivative terms. Does that make sense? Okay. So in the end, this is going to give us a dot over a squared is equal to 8 pi g over 3 rho minus k over a squared, which is often called the Friedman equation. Okay? <clears throat> Solutions to this equation, given all that's gone into developing it, are often what are called Friedman Robertson Walker cosmological models. And they, they scan quite a bit of possibility. Of course, you know, after you fold in the obser observed data, you'll get to a specific one. But this is a class of solutions, which are basically celebrating the spatial isotropy, the spatial homogeneity, and then the potentiality of time dependence. OK? How about some more jargon? What do you think? Yeah, let's do some more jargon. Lots of jargon in cosmology. Uh, let me see, where can I erase? Uh, I don't know where I can erase. All right, I'm poorly scheduling myself. Okay, so let's define h of t as a dot of t over a of t. Okay? That is, we've got this dimensionless scale factor, and we are defining a factor, which of course depends on time, because both of these depend on time, which is the derivative of a with respect to time over a itself. We'll call it big H. Why will we call it big H? Drew, any idea why big H would go there? I mean, I have your notes open, so. No, you can't look. <laughs> you have to guess. What name? The Hubble parameter. Yeah, this is the Hubble parameter. Okay. Hubble parameter tells us a very interesting story. First and foremost, if it's greater than zero, the universe is expanding. If it's less than zero, it's contracting. If it's equal to zero, nothing's happening. Okay. No, A of t is going to be a positive thing. It's the scale of the universe. So we're really just looking at the sign of the derivative. The derivative is positive. It's expanding. It's growing. If the derivative is negative, it's getting smaller. Okay. If we put this into Friedman's equation, then Friedman's equation simply becomes h squared is 8 pi g over 3 rho minus k over a squared. Okay? We'll use this extensively. That's why it's going in the square. Okay? But now let's look for an interesting result. First of all, we have v physical which is the derivative of the physical length with respect to time. 
That is, if I take two objects and I'm considering their relative velocity, their relative velocity is the derivative of their physical distance with respect to time. Okay? Now, this, of course, is the derivative of the scale factor times the coordinate distance. with respect to time, the coordinate distance is fixed. I'm talking, of course, about the, the motion between things due to the expansion or contraction of the universe. I'm not talking about just things blasting off, okay? So you can then capture the, the contraction of the expansion of the universe through the scale factor, and then this is a fixed coordinate distance. So these are the same expression. Physical distance is coordinate distance times the scale factor. Okay, this thing obviously changes with time, but that's due to the A of T factor. But of course, this is just A dot times the coordinate distance. Okay? Because the coordinate distance is fixed. D by DT doesn't touch it. But this means that we can write this as A dot over A times L physical. Because L physical is just A times L coordinate. That might seem stupid, right? No. Because this tells us that the physical velocity, which we see something moving away from us or towards us with, is equal to the Hubble parameter times the physical distance. Any idea what this tells us? Is that just the speed at which the universe is expanding? It is, but it tells us something. Well, it was actually tied up in what you said. It tells us that this universe is expanding. Why well, seems stupid? Well, let me actually show you exactly what I mean. And I'm going to erase this, and I know I'm going to hate it, but we'll just do it anyway. I want you to consider two cases. First and foremost, I want you to consider a one-dimensional universe for simplicity. And we'll just explore the behavior of five points in this universe. And then later we will do the same down here. In the first case, we have positions x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals minus 1, x equals minus 2. In the second case, we've got the same labels. In the first case, what we're going to have is that this is going to be moving at rest. This is where the observer sits. And then at x1, we'll have v equals 1. And at x2, we'll have v equals 2. We'll have v equals minus 1 and v equals minus 2. Down here, we'll have v equals 0. This is where our observer sits. And here, we'll have v equals, oh, hold on, v equals v naught. For such a big v naught, you need to know what? v equals v naught, v equals minus v naught, v equals minus v naught. First and foremost, which of these satisfies Hubble's law? Case A or case B? Case A. Case A, yeah. The, Velocity has got to be proportional to the distance. Okay, this is just normalizing h to 1. x equals minus 1, v equals minus 1. x equals 2, v equals minus 2. Sorry, this should be minus 2. Thanks for correcting me, folks. I do appreciate it. In this case, that's not happening. 
What does this describe? An expanding line. What does this describe? This describes an explosion. Okay? I mean, after all, if you explode, you send stuff out, all the little bits that go out have the same velocity. Okay? The argument is that in this case, the space is expanding. In this case, the space is fixed and you just got shit flying out. Now there's a very important distinction between these. If my observer is here, will they see the same thing that an observer here would see? No, they would not. This observer will see everything to that side at rest with respect to it. Does that make sense? Okay. It would see this moving to the left with the speed V0. It would see these moving to the left with the speed 2V0. That is definitely not homogeneous. What about this story? It might be hard to see, but if you pick your observer at any other spot, they will see the same thing. Does that make sense? So this is the story of the expansion of the space versus just shit flying everywhere. The reason this is important is because so many people think of the Big Bang as space and then this big thing that blows up and send shit everywhere. That is not at all, at, at all what the Big Bang is. The Big Bang is the expansion of space throughout time. Okay? All right. Oh boy, running out of time again. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we are going to explore some of the different contributions to the energy momentum tensor, which we expect the universe as a whole to display. So, <clears throat> so we've got the Friedman equation, and since A in the Friedman equation depends on T, and rho in the Friedman equation depends on T. We could, in principle, figure out how rho depends on A, or A depends on rho, okay? So in order to do this, I want you to consider del mu T mu nu equals zero. This is the conservation of energy and momentum, okay? If we take this and we hit it with the factor of the metric, then this is just going to become del mu t mu alpha equals zero. And if we take the alpha equals zero term, this is going to give us del mu t mu zero equals minus the derivative of the energy density with respect to time minus three times a dot over a, rho plus p, okay? And this is equal to zero. Now, let us for a moment assume that p is related by an equation of state to rho, where w here is just a simple constant. Then we have the following. This equation becomes zero equals minus rho dot minus three a dot over a one plus w times
times rho, which we can rewrite as rho dot over rho is minus 3, 1 plus w, a dot over a. Well, hell, that's kind of easy. This gives us that ln of rho is minus 3, 1 plus w, ln of a, or better still, rho of t is proportional to a of t to the minus 3, 1 plus w. Okay? Now, every time I throw this math at you and I get this cool little equation-like result, the first thing you should say is, can you uh, make that intuitive? Can you make it make sense? Am I going to say that? Can you make it make sense? Yes, I can. Okay, here we go. Thanks for asking. Alright, I'll hang on to Hubble, and we'll make that make sense. Well, let's consider a few contributions to the energy momentum of the universe. Let's first and foremost talk about matter, or dust, for simplicity. You might or might not remember, but for the dust approximation, you basically take the pressure to be Zero. Thank you for all those responses. So we're taking the pressure of dust-like matter to be zero. Here's an easy one, which Paul will give me the answer to. Paul, what is W? Zero. It's zero. Exactly. I know. I'm never going to ask hard questions when I can just ask easy ones. Therefore, the energy density for matter scales as a to the minus 3. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're talking about the energy density in a volume which is expanding. Okay? So this is basically scaling as 1 over the volume. Okay? Well, that might seem trivial, so let's try a more complicated one. Let's consider radiation. Okay? Or any highly relativistic matter, it doesn't matter. P for radiation takes the form of one third times the energy density for radiation. Therefore, W is one third. And this tells us that the energy density for radiation scales as a to the minus 4. Does that make sense? Yeah. Ray, radiation is... It's, uh, this is not changing with the volume. It's changing with a to the 4. Actually, it does make sense. You get a volume dilution. This is, of course, assuming it's expanding. With a redshift. The radiation is moving in some direction. It's got to be. And along that direction, you'll have a redshift, which is going to be proportional to 1 over a. It's combined with the volume dilution to give me a to the minus 4. So it does make sense. Okay? A redshift is a change in the energy. Okay? We've got one more, and that is the vacuum. For the vacuum, we have the T mu nu, in case you don't remember, T mu nu is proportional to the metric. So this tells us that the pressure is minus the energy density associated with the vacuum, which tells us that in this case, W is minus one, which tells us that the energy density of a vacuum is proportional to a to the zero. It's constant. Okay? It's a little bit weird. But remember, 
remember, it's a vacuum energy density. It's not that you have stuff there and the universe is expanding and that stuff is getting diluted. It's a vacuum energy. It's not associated with stuff. Okay? Now, rho total, the total energy density of the universe is rho m plus rho r plus rho v. But what we can also do is we can define the energy density associated with the curvature as minus 3k over 8 pi g a squared, okay? And in this case, Friedman's equation simplifies to the following form. Okay, that is, the Hubble parameter squared is simply this coefficient times a sum over all of the contributions to the energy density. These include matter, radiation, the vacuum, and a contribution due to curvature. Okay? All right, I think we're going to end there just to end on time, because I know you guys love it. But guess where I would have gotten had I gone about 10 minutes over? I would have predicted the Big Bang. But I'll let you guys go. Bye. <laughs> we'll do it next time.